Hello, everybody. Mick here. Hope everybody's having a wonderful, beautiful day. Um, <clears throat> today, we're going to start a discussion about toxic narcissism and uh, what it looks like in behavioral settings and the etiology of this condition. Uh, this is going to finish up our the dark triad, what we call the dark triad. Remember, there there were well, there are three personality conditions that's intertwined with the dark triad. And they are uh, psychopathy, sociopathy, which is one, Machiavellianism, which we did, is number two, and then number three is uh, pathological or, or toxic uh, narcissism. Now, the sociopathy and psychopathy are in, in Machia and Machiavellianism, they're subsumed under that heading of uh, antisocial disorder. And then today we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about narcissism or pathological narcissism. <clears throat> and these are referred to as uh, what we call cluster B disorders. Uh, it's, a, it's this erratic sort of dramatic countenance. And it also includes uh, borderline personality disorder and uh, histrionic personality disorder. So, uh, hmm, I, it, you know, it may be confusing, but real quickly, uh, I want to kind of describe the structure uh, of the 10 personality conditions that's uh, listed in our, in our DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Mental or of Mental Disorders. And this is it right here. This is our current, current copy. This is sort of our uh, guidebook for uh, diagnosis. <clears throat> so we have these 10, right, that, that are listed in here. And they fall under three different clusters, A, B, and C. Now, cluster A is known as the odd eccentric cluster, odd and eccentric. And, <clears throat> and they are schizoid, schizotypal, and paranoid uh, personality conditions. The second cluster B, which we're in, of course, is known as the dramatic erratic, uh, and they are antisocial which I broke down into Machiavellianism, uh, pathological narcissism, and then, of course, psychopathy, sociopathy. Uh, that's, that, that's combined there. Uh, so I clumped these three together under what's called the antisocial condition. Now, the second condition is, is of course, narcissism, which we're talking about today. And then there's the third, which is borderline personality disorder, and then lastly, histrionic. Uh, then we have what's known as the cluster C, <clears throat> this anxious, fearful, uh, and they include dependent personality conditions, uh, avoidant personality conditions, and lastly, uh, OCPD, uh, which is totally different than, than, than OCD, but OCPD, all right, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, as I mentioned earlier. The plan is to blog about all, all the PCs over the next, excuse me, over the next several weeks, uh, depending on my work and, you know, the fishing schedule uh, that I have. So we're going to try to get through all, all 10 of them. <clears throat> you know, some people have asked me, you know, why it is important to know about a person's personality, uh, let's say if you're treating them for depression or, or anxiety. <clears throat> maybe an adjustment disorder, or even uh, a, a paraphilic disorder, okay? Well, you know, it, it really helps to set up two very important aspects of therapy organization. This is organizing the therapy. And, and those two important aspects are called case conceptualization and treatment planning, okay? So just don't think that, hey, uh, these therapists are out there shooting from the hip. They're, they actually set up, they case conceptualize, and then uh, we'll write up a, a, a treatment plan. We also write up our case conceptualization. So, you know, the reason we do this, <clears throat> let's say someone comes in for, uh, let's say with social anxiety, okay, where they, where they get really anxious around people or uh, you know, being in the 
the cent or being the center of attention. Uh, perhaps they got a big presentation coming up uh, at work, and and they have massive stage fright, okay, uh, which is a freezing condition uh, from a, a over activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, and this is uh, this is form of social anxiety, social anxiety. If I'm going to case conceptualize correctly, then, then I would need to know if they have a personality condition uh, like histrionic, you know, this overly dramatic personality disorder where they are emotionally dysregulated. So I need to do that correctly to treat the case conceptualize it and treat them. Or, uh, hey, how about this? What if they suffer from a paranoid personality disorder? And they've got to give some sort of presentation. You know, can, can you imagine a paranoid on? Uh, uh, I don't mean to say paranoid, but somebody with uh, paranoid uh, paranoid disorder on stage. You know, they're going to be like, uh, "Hey, you know, wh what are you guys looking at? Uh, you know, what, what's everybody staring at here?" <clears throat> so you can just imagine uh, the these complications of of both you know, in case conceptualization and, and treatment planning. Uh, so, you know, so that's, so that's why, you know, we, 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 we like to do that. So, so you know, uh, <clears throat> that does, it changes the background in, in, those, in those treatment approaches. Now, the old uh, DSM-4R, which is this one here, you know, right here, uh, and, it has these axes. It's got five axes. And axes two uh, talked about personality disorder. So you had to you had to include that in your assessment within the case conceptualization. And you know, and the treatment plan. But you know, in the five here, you know, it's changed all that. So you necessarily don't have to go through those axes. And uh <clears throat> You know, what's, what's funny was several years back, because this came out, the five came out in 2013, <coughs> uh, I was reading and, and, and comparing all the changes between the two versions. And, you know, they made up task force for each sort of section, okay? Um, and that the task force for the personality conditions, uh, they didn't want to include narcissistic personality disorder in the new edition, in the five. But the narcissists within the task force, <laughs> they sternly objected because, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't stand the idea of no longer uh, being recognized with this uh, uh, sacrosanct book of psychology and psychiatry. So uh, whether that was a joke or not, uh, I thought it was kind of amusing. So, okay. <clears throat> so now, on to the tripartite, the last one. Uh, narcissistic personality disorder, the uh, the last of the dark triad here, and um, it's you know you'll hear it as pathological narcissism, or uh, you know what I like to call just basically toxic narcissism. Okay, uh, you know as always as always, <clears throat> I will remind the listeners that that besides the direct criteria. Uh, I think there's nine of them for narcissism uh, listed under each condition, these specific symptoms. Uh, there are six general criteria, I think, which requires, you know, to discuss. And I'll, re I'll cover these in every single one, and you'll probably be able to recite them like me uh, off the top of your head. Okay, so the general six, the six general criteria uh, for a PD to exist First, the conditions must be markedly different from the normal behavior that is accepted in society or in cultural norms, okay? So uh, an example is, let's say, uh, an overly flatulent person is uh, in public, you know, and to me, that, you know, it's, you, it's funny and all, you know, unless you're around him or her, but... Uh, that can indicate what we call a schizotypal behavior, you know, it's in that respect. Uh, 
uh, number two, the second person I commission uh, from the ten that I listed above. Remember, I was pretty close here. Uh, the second condition, uh, it, it must cause extreme distress or relationship to us uh, or an occupational or other social environment. That's pretty easy to remember. Third, the condition must remain pervasive and consistent across all different domains and, and throughout the time period. You know, That's easy for me because that's sort of the what we say is the definition for personality, you know, pervasive. And it remains constant, uh, and it goes includes all just goes all uh, scenarios and situations. You know. Number four, <clears throat> number four, we must be able to trace this condition back to childhood or or to adolescence. <clears throat> um, so, so an example would be is if an individual, a young, a young lad. Ladies is diagnosed with conduct disorder in earlier years, you know, in their earlier years when they're a uh, child or uh, an adolescent, uh, it'll meet the criteria for antisocial diagnosis uh, later on when they become an adult. Okay, because that's one of the criteria for antisocial. Uh, number five, <clears throat> which I, I goes along with number four, the uh, condition cannot be better explained than with a behavioral disorder such as uh, bipolar or unipolar mania. You know, that's uh, not in the five, but we're seeing that just somebody that presents just with mania alone. So we call it uni unipolar mania, unipolar mania. Um, or let's say they have a trauma-based disorder. We, we could diagnose, so they can't have that. So in those, typically, they're not as enduring or, or as lifelong as personality conditions. And then the last one, uh, the personality condition cannot be associated with a substance or some uh, external uh, perturbation, uh, you know, like lead poisoning or, or some sort of toxic chemical ingestion. Okay, so that's a, that's a it's something that's perturbing. Okay. <clears throat> now the. Uh, which is interesting here. We're going to go back a little bit. I always like going over history and background. So the word narcissism comes from, actually from Greek mythology. It was a <coughs> character named uh, Narcissus, was his name. And uh, he was a hunter who was known for his beauty. Okay. Uh, according to Oron, he rejected all of these romantic advances you know, eventually falling in love with himself uh, in his own reflection of a pool of water. And he stared at it incessantly, and later he died. And, and in his place, uh, a sprout of flower, you know, bearing his name. So uh, the character of Narcissus uh, is the origin of the term Narcissist. Okay? Uh, it's a fixation with oneself. <clears throat> now, a healthy dose of narcissism, you know, we should possess that. Uh, we need to be able to focus, uh, you know, on self needs and uh, individual aspirations that, you know, feed and complement our inner self, our inner self esteem or, or self concept. This this is healthy, harmonious balance of self and others. It, it becomes pathological when self becomes a greater force, okay? Just this uh, more expansive way of relating with, with the world, which is self-oriented and, and above the genuine needs and wants of others. You know, basically, uh, we become number one, number two, number three, and, and pecking at the world. So that's, that's, that's what the, the narcissist basically is. He or she, you know, they're number one, number two, and number three, okay? <clears throat> there are two types of mal maladaptive toxic narcissism that are recognized within the clinical world, and that is grandiose, which gets heard a lot, you know, NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, and, and vulnerable NPD. I know I call them disorders. Or conditions. 
with gambling disorders in, in our book, our own book, but <clears throat> I use conditions. And I explain that a lot on the channel that's related to that, that way. But only only grandiose is mentioned, you know, in, in the plot here. Uh, but, you know, yes, I, I truly believe, you know, there are these two different branches. Okay, they're grandiose and, and vulnerable. Uh, and it, these branches from the branches from the narcissistic personality disorder. And, you know, I've treated I've treated patients exhibiting these conditions as both grandiose and vulnerable. I will say treating clients with cluster B conditions, remember, you know, like I said, if they are well narcissistic or and uh, histrionic or borderline, <clears throat> those I think are the most attractive. As compared with the other two, well, except for maybe uh, OCPD and schizotypal, you know those those are very difficult. And with any any PC uh, client, you know, they, they almost have no clue. They exhibit these traits and, and automatic behavior. So I mean, they're just there's no clue for them. We call it egocentric. Uh, and at times, therapy can be almost uh, suffocating, and uh, <laughs> I say it kind of agonizing, you know, for both the client and the therapist. So, grandiose MPD. You know, what does it look like? You know, the severe behaviors are easy to recognize. Okay, so if it's severe. Very easy to recognize, but we're going to talk about some things that are, are, are less uh, available to, to knowledge or to the, to the eye, you know, when you're around people. But the most severe ones, you know, they tend to be bombastic. Uh, I want to say they're interruptive, okay? They're intrusive. And, of course, you know, they're, they're self-centered. Um, they crave, you know, they crave the limelight. The, the accolades and <clears throat> and the praise that, that goes along with being being the center of attention. You know, we have a bar stool in our office. Not my office, but it's his. So let's you know, like so we're going a little bit deeper in what it may look like at a level that's not so recognizable. <clears throat> but you know, before I do that, I want to stress this is this is really important. And I made a note of it, I hadn't said it yet, but I need to say this. Those with MPD, they have this sort of fantastical or this fantasy and, and fabulation. It's, it's a huge part of the psyche, okay? So please remember that. This fantastical, fantasy-oriented, almost like a fabulous, you know, they're making up stories. That's part of their psyche. You know, they, they're daydreaming. Uh, they don't live in reality. Uh, they, they at times, you know, most often than not, uh, create and fabricate stories of vacations, of accomplishments, or, or possessions. Um, anything, that, anything that serves their fragmented ego. So uh, this is the basis of uh, MPD. You know, like I said, they're, they're egocentric. They're, they do not realize nor care to even explore their psychopathic or psychopathologic personality. You know, it's, it's alien to their thought or, or, or emotional process. All right. Moving along, moving along. <clears throat> what we may notice uh, with the first with MPD is they play this card of what I call one-upmanship. That is, no matter what someone has done or, you know, what they own, that person with MPD, they have something better or greater, you know, this, this one-upmanship. Now, on the other hand, you know, if they can't beat someone out, uh, they will diminish or, or devalue the other's accomplishments, 
or a sheep. Now just, just think about that for a minute. What we have, somebody with one-upmanship, okay, they're always telling the better story or, or they've been there, or if they can't outdo them, then they're going to have this complete deflation of another's accomplishment. So, you know, that's, and that's where the fantasy and the, and the fabulation comes in. You know, it could be half true or some true or just totally false. But okay, so I'm, I'm going to read, it's the best for me to read the criteria here out of the DSM. Narcissistic Personality Disorder, page 669, okay? <clears throat> now, like I said, there are nine sub-criteria, but <clears throat> I want to read here. So, um, it's a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior. There's a need for admiration, a lack of empathy, beginning by early adulthood, and present in a variety of contexts, as indicated by five of, or more of the following, okay? So there's nine. So we look at if they have five or more, uh, they meet clinical diagnostic criteria. Number one, <clears throat> has a grandiose sense of self-importance. You know, they, they exaggerate their talents in order to be recognized as, as superior with, without the commensurate achievement. Um, hubristic comes to mind. I mean, you know, boastful or, or even pretentious, okay? They, you know, they always seem to want the best or they have the best or they pretend to have the best. You know, I think these people... They'll, they'll be in extreme debt be beyond their, their financial means uh, because they want to maintain or, or look like they have these things. Okay. Number two, is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Okay. Vanity comes to mind in this for me. You know, they tend to daydream about being a superstar and having this unlimited fame and fortune, you know, which comes with admiration uh, from the popular press, okay? And so, the uh, brilliance. I'm going to talk about brilliance a little bit later on, you know, when I, with these fantasies, okay? Number three, believes that he or she is special and unique. And can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. Okay? So, this brilliance, they may appear like, you know, they hang out with all these people. Like in college, you know, I see this a lot, you know, I'm from this institution and I have this pedigree and those things, which is great and, uh, and, um, and, and I welcome. That, but when you over promote it, and some people do, you know, they, they constantly, if you're around them, you hear it over and over. <laughs> so, uh, you know, not, not only are they this self fabulous, but you know, they'll also exaggerate and embellish or, or completely fabricate the status or positive attributes of others they associate with. So, if they can't, you know, make something up about themselves, they're going to make up something about those that they hang around, you know, who they associate with. Uh, I think we can, you know, if we go back, we can recognize this behavior in the earlier ages, you know, especially around 5 and 13 years old. Okay. Uh, these, these young kiddos, they'll tell whoppers or they'll spin these tall tales. That, you know, an adult knows to be made up. And I think this is a developmental indicator for a future NPD diagnosis. Okay, number four, requires excessive admiration. 
class clown comes to mind, or the cut up, uh, where they want to be admired or noticed to the point of ridicule. This this will indicate their their self esteem is almost invariably fragile, and it takes the form of a need for constant attention. In this, you know, the one that's always remember I said interruptive, you know. They could be interruptive away so they get the attention. Um, they covet these these compliments as to being you know, super funny, uh, especially witty and bright, or expect you know, they'll expect others to, to positively comment uh, on the you know their possessions, what they got, their appearance, uh, their adept mannerisms. You know, and if these things aren't forthcoming from others, they'll broach the subject of, of admiration. You know, and, and they'll elicit this required attention in that direction. So, number five, has a sense of entitlement, i.e. unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. Okay. You know, they'll cut in front of others, things like that. Um, they'll go when it's not their turn. They think somehow they're special in that. I think one I see a lot is people who jump into a parking spot uh, another person was getting ready to take. Oh, well, oh, well. You know, knowing what, what they're doing, but, you know, they don't care. So, <clears throat> number six, they are interpersonally exploitative. So, interpersonally exploitative, what does this mean? Interpersonally means you use others, okay? Their wants and needs are the priority, <clears throat> and they expect assistance or, uh, or, favor or favorable regard. They'll, they'll come to others for favors, but not return the gesture, okay? You, you, you know, the ones that who ask for help with moving, that's a, that's a good one there, or with these big projects. Uh, but when it comes time to return the favor, uh, they are emphatically, emphatically, um, you, know, not, you know, not there. They're not available, okay? And all that. So, yeah. All you hear is uh, crickets sometimes. They won't answer the phone. They won't answer the phone call. So, all right, number seven. Number seven. Lacks empathy. Is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. I'm going to call this marginal empathy or situational empathy. <clears throat> okay, so lacks normal empathy. They have an overarching need. I'm going to give you an example. They have this this overarching need to discuss their own issues or concerns in, in an inappropriate or lengthy detail. <laughs> you know, we've seen that, right? Uh, again, it kind of goes back to one-upmanship a little bit. You know, they're interruptive. And you're trying to tell somebody something and they interrupt. And theirs is, you know, they've got a worse medical condition or things of that nature. And, and it ignores others' needs or so, you know, what we'll see is uh, contemptuous and impatient behavior uh, with others, you know, who who talk about themselves because they can't stand it. So, yeah, they're just oblivious. You know, they're oblivious to hurtful remarks or actions can cost others. <clears throat> when, when we relate to someone with N NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, you know, there's this an emotional coldness. Remember, it's not you know like this empathy stuff kind of a thing. Or you may even see this disingenuous or function to sort of feint their, their empathy. And they may start out the romantic uh, relationship showing a lot of tension, uh, but then again, it, it changes. You know, and and all focus is on them, and it's 
for some, it's just crickets. You know, I mean, they're like, you know, the other side of the room. And I got to the point where, you know, I'm going to talk about it now. I don't know if you guys can hear me or anything, but I mean, that's just what you heard me say. Now, number eight, number eight. Often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her. Again, being back to fantasy, they have this fantasy that others are jealous of them or if someone appears better off, you know, what they're going to do is they're going to ascribe this, assign this cheating or this person they cut corners or others, you know, they're the recipient of others' help. Like, you know, they're well off because of the inheritance or, or lucky fortune. See, they diminish in the value of others' accomplishments if they can't have that one-upmanship if, if they're not rich. Okay. All right, I'm about done with this anyway. Number nine, I feel it all over my book here. Shows arrogant, haughty behaviors and or attitudes. I got several of those. Okay, here we go. Um, Cavalier. Cavalier comes to mind for me a lot, you know, um, this haughty sort of way of being. And this is where, you know, the denigrating or the condescension, the condescension to others I mean, comes, comes into focus, right? Uh, I guess we can describe them sometimes as snobbish, uh, disdainful, patronizing for sure, right? Or just, just downright rude. They, they may, they may comment to another. I'm gonna talk about this one. They may comment to another associate of the negative aspects of others, right? So they're this habitual gossip. If they can't do better, then they're gonna devalue or denigrate on their end. You know what? Also. To add to number nine here, I think it's really important, is we'll very seldom hear a person with MPD say that, I'm sorry. You know, we won't hear that comment, I'm sorry. You know, this is not in their vocabulary. Because you've got to remember their self-esteem is fragile. And, and any indication of being called out or any criticism is taken out of context. <coughs> and and this could leave, you know, this could leave these individuals feeling humiliated, degraded, hollow, and empty. Um, there are some higher suicide rates for those diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. <coughs> A lot of things like that. I didn't even really prepare for that, but that came to mind. I could give you the, I want to say, if any of you want to look it up, the pages are all wet. <laughs> You know, we've been talking about the, the uh, I know, grandiose, and, and now I want to talk about the, uh, the vulnerable, the, the vulnerable um, narcissist, okay? And like I said, you won't find that in, in um, the five, but I've treated the, the vulnerable narcissist and both grandiose. Uh, but the vulnerable, you know, he or she <clears throat> will present as, as shy. This look of being vulnerable, they'll present right shy, uh, insecure, and they are shame ridden. Now, fantasy is also a foundation for this substitute, but instead of in your face arrogance, it's overwhelming pity pity for their situation, pity for their life or any other avenue where they can elicit pity from others. Um, women, you know, tend to be more oriented to this group. Uh, and I've seen what is known as what we call Munchausen by proxy, okay, where a mother or another either fabricates or produces this ill health or this disadvantage in, in, in another person their offspring, maybe, could be a spouse, <clears throat> in order to gain the attention and pity of others. 
uh, it's just it's just fabricated pity theory. Now, the infamous Munchen. Okay, uh, he was an infamous character. That was right after the Crimean War. Uh, who would go to these British taverns, <coughs> pretending to be this this decorated British soldier during the Crimean War. Uh, today we, we call it stolen money. What a parent, a spouse, uh, you know, could the mother, the wife, the husband, the caregiver, they will, you know, they'll highly exaggerate the ill health of a child, or even I've seen it to where they'll produce these deleterious symptoms to make the child actually sick. So. Uh, Munchausen by proxy, okay, but that's not the case. Uh, you know, so if they can't do it by proxy, they'll also they'll feign injury or illness themselves, and tell you know everybody within their circle and talk to them. <coughs> you know who will listen. So I think this is where vulnerable narcissism, you know, it kind of crosses over in the realm of of histrionic disorder. If I could draw circles, you know, all these sort of, we have, think of something like the Olympic circles. They all intertwine. So these symptoms will overlap with each other. So I think this is where it overlaps with in the realm of histrionic disorder, which is this uh, dramatic state of crises or the crisis. Okay. Now, now the sad part is it becomes this cycle of self-fulfilling prophecy <clears throat> where they uh, they unwittingly or, or subconsciously, you know, they, they make their lives this, this roiling sort of roller coaster ride of dramatic interludes. And I'm sure we all know people like that or we've been around people like that. So, but deep down, you know, they all want to be admired for their ability to to weather these self-fabricated issues um, and, and be acknowledged for being such a, a stalwart rock of strength uh, when in true fashion, you know, they're just really like sandstone or salt. You know? So these bad things, they keep just happening over and over. <clears throat> and, and they don't realize be it's because of their, their mental instability, remember? I told you they're egocentric. They don't realize they're this way, so they're just like this lightning rod for, for, for a dysfunctional current. All right. So uh, another way to sort of tell if somebody has these narcissistic traits is if they lose friends or acquaintances rather quickly. And I think a big thing is when I ask is, you know. Tell me five life, you know, list five friends who are lifelong friends, right? So they're characterized by really no lifelong friendship. And when I say friends, you can't include cousins or family members. So that's something I always want to know. Um, you know, even these romantic relationships, they end with, with the other exasperated, uh, almost, almost worn out. Uh, by the experience, okay. I want, now, this is, I want you to remember this here. I want you to remember what is known as a rule of three. <clears throat> okay, the rule of three. If someone does not do what they say, or if you feel like you're being used or manipulated for the third time, okay, move on. Move on. You know, the first two times can be, we can chalk it up to extenuating circumstances, but the third is a pattern, okay? And also, too, I want to say, someone who plays that pity card uh, on a regular basis, let's, you know, let's just move on. So the rule of three, right? <clears throat> All right, etiology. So etiology NPD. Where did it come from? Or what causes this personality disruption? I think what, what
what causes it is is brain and circuit formation of overly sensitive cortical regions. Yeah. And, and the wear is in early childhood to uh, adolescent development period. So these times we'll, we'll see uh, promotion of neglect, abuse, uh, emotional dysregulation, and yeah, uh, even an overly pampering and excessive rewarding parental approach to raising a child. Okay. Now these are both coexisting in the household environment, but you know they can produce the same thing, uh, and that is an adulthood self control. Now, I don't want to go in too deep to the neurochemical imbalance that is experienced with MPD, but let's just suffice to say that the reward pathway uh, is called the striatum, and its uh, dopaminergic release is, is a little off. Uh, the serotonergic cascades, you know, it affects our mood. Those are, those are off. The endogenous opiate system, right? And oxytocin is, is dysregulated and, and, and out of whack. So, uh, you know, I professionally feel that uh, I'm going to tell you a story. I had a client, and she's married in her mid 30s, and she had a child. And I wasn't treating her for this one thing I was telling you about, but it came up. She told me that she just didn't have the, when she looked at everybody else with her children and how they reacted and saw the facial expressions and the bonding, as you can see, that sort of, that extra that a parent has with a child, she says that she just didn't, she couldn't feel that. You know, now I knew her developmental story, her trajectory. And I felt like the oxytocin and the endogenous opiate system, along with the, the serotonergic and dopaminergic system, didn't develop correctly, okay? And that's what happens in development. When you're going through, your brain will wire up. And uh, uh, it stays with you for, for adulthood. So <clears throat> I think those with MPD, I think they, they have a better chance of diminishing their PD compared to either uh, psychopathy or, or Machiavellianism that I talked about earlier. So, you know, this is not so much brain structure as it is brain function. And it's clinically proven that what we call synaptogenesis and synaptoplasticity, you know, can occur during adulthood, during therapy, helping to change behavior. Okay. Now, now our gray matter will not change, okay, I except for aging. Uh, a process is, you know, what we call uh, optotosis. <laughs> optotosis. Apoptosis, excuse me. It's been a while since I said that word. <laughs> but but the connections of the neurons, right? The synapses, when they come together, you know, view it like this in between, the space in between, the uh, the, the neuron, you know, what we call the, the axon as it comes down. And, you know, we have presynaptic and postsynaptic here. These can change, you know, just... So that's where we get the plasticity from. So, you know, in a nutshell, the sensitive nature of, of the firing of the neurons can be reduced. And that's what we call when something's sensitive, it's, it's overly regulated, overly dysregulated. Uh, and habituation is where there's a decrease. But... <clears throat> This overfiring of neurons can be re reduced, or if needed, the increase we can increase the activation of 
certain synapses can be upregulated, okay? So I didn't want to get too much into that. But, uh, we're going to talk about what it looks like in this developmental period here, uh, what it really looks like at the attachment between child and caregiver, uh, and it's namely the mother, okay? But we're not putting the onus on the mom. You know, fathers are responsible also. And I talked about it in a blog a while back about fatherhood. But um, when it comes to attachment, uh, I, I put two vlog vlogs up on adult attachment. And, you know, if hopefully you can remember that, well, hopefully I can remember, but there are four types of adult attachment, okay? So there are four types, but they're under two banners. The first is secure, all right? Now, about 40% of the adults, 45%, okay, they're considered securely attached, right? Uh, and the rest is what we call insecure, about 60%. Now, under insecure, there are three. There are three types. Uh, the first is what we call anxious preoccupied attachment. I think this is seen more in the vulnerable presentation of NPD, where that person comes from an anxious, preoccupied attachment, or the uh, vulnerable narcissism. Uh, the next one is is what we call avoidant, you know, dismissive avoidant. Okay, and and then we have fearful avoidant. I had to come back real quick. Dismissive avoidant is, you know, it's just that, right? There's no interest in, in their mate outside of their own needs. Kind of the cricket sort of deal I'm talking about. And then the fearful avoidant is their mate. Their mate is their source of fear, believe it or not. You know, it's kind of hard to, to understand, but because when they were young, when I say young, you know, about two, three to two years to zero, or from the neonate up to about three years, development and what the brain is doing is just, I mean, it's its growing in size exponentially, about 120, 20% in the first two years, okay? It grows. So when we're talking about fearful avoiding here, their safety zone, right? The parent. You know, it's also, it was a source, it's a source of comfort, but it's also a source of fear, okay? So the person that that child needs to go to, they see him as comfort, but they also fear him. And, you know, they'll carry that over in, into adulthood. And I think a lot of times with that, we'll see a vicarious type of display for MPD. Uh, you know, these don't always hold true. In all cases, just the preponderance of, of attachment type, I think. Now, I've probably read it somewhere. Uh, it's probably why. I don't know if I've ever had an original thought or not. <laughs> but uh, I think the preponderance of attachment types fit these presentations of MPD, okay? So in that, the uh, fearful avoidant is you'll see gregarious. And then what we call the... Uh, the other one, the uh, overly pre preoccupied attachment, we'll see in vulnerable, okay? So ambivalent, preoccupied. What, what occurs in these insecure attachments is, and I've talked about it, is toxic shame, right? Toxic shame. It becomes internalized, and instead of receding in their shell, so, so to speak, they have a they have this opposite reaction of overcompensation in the gregarious into the hey look at me, you know hey hey everybody you know look at me, so uh, you know this is this is what we see. So the ideology, like I said, is is what does it come from? It, it comes from brain development. You know these overly sensitive or utterly sensitive. Uh, areas in the brain. Now, the gray matter is no different than everybody. It's just how the function of it, okay? So the structure 
isn't necessarily different. It's just the function, as with synaptogenesis, and uh, you know the synapses working okay in that. Now um, that's it. I mean that's all I can pretty much think of. That's all I have in my notes on the dark triad. So we covered psychopathy, sociopathy, Machiavellianism, and narcissism. Now on the next one, I'm getting. I'm going to cover. Um, Histrionic and borderline. So this cluster B is what we would call toxic people, but I'm not sure that I'm going to next one to do that to do the histrionic and, and borderline. What I may do is I've had some questions about good and evil, you know, and to talk about evil. So that'll be kind of a 20 minute one. It won't be so bad. So that's probably what I'm going to do next time. But, you know, as always, if you have questions, hey, look, shoot them to me. I'm here. You know, God bless you. I hope you have a great day, a great week. And if there's anything I can do, you can email me at uh, agapicounselor at outlook.com. Agapicounselor at outlook.com, okay? All right. As always, God bless, and I love you. See you next time.